You perhaps have heard it was Facebook's 15th birthday this week, and each year its users get a little personalised video of their photos and their memories. A thank you for all that personal data, perhaps. So we thought we'd do the same for Mark Zuckerberg's baby, and after a quick look back at all that controversy, we're wondering if Facebook is unbreakable. Very good to have you with us. You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. Created, as we perhaps know, from the confines of a college dorm to 2.2 billion members. Facebook is larger than any single nation, language, even religion. And it's got the scandals to prove it. <laughs> There was not a lot to like about Facebook in 2018. In March, it was revealed Cambridge Analytica had harvested tens of millions of users' personal data without their consent. Congressional hearings followed to investigate the data breach and possible Russian interference in the American 2016 elections. Scrutiny increased after a rash of murders in India linked to rumours and misinformation spreading virally on Facebook's messaging app, WhatsApp. In July, after much public outcry, founder Mark Zuckerberg was forced to disavow his awkward defence of Holocaust deniers on the site. And in November, a New York Times report revealed Facebook hired a PR firm which attempted to discredit the company's critics. But that is only a few of Facebook's lowlights. If the social media giant fails to clean up its act, will more users hit delete? Please say that joining us from San Diego, California, Brooke Binkowski, the managing director of fact-checking site Truth or Fiction. We go to Dublin next. Steve Dempsey there, the head of product at INM and a media and marketing columnist for the Sunday Independent. With me at the round table, Stacey Walsh, consultant on digital policy and cybersecurity at Oxford Information Labs and lawyer at Freeth's LLP and social media specialist Kevin Porter. Well, that was one heck of an introduction. It's not the sort of thing you might see on Facebook uh, under personal information, but at least we've got it all out there. Brooke, let's come to you first, because you've got up in some unholy hour in, in <laughs> California. Illegal data mining, bad headlines, 11 previous scandals, at least if you, if you do a quick Google search, always in the news, and yet Facebook has never been prosecuted. Why? I think it's that whole too big to fail mentality. You know, there's just too many people on there. It's insinuated itself into way too many aspects of our lives. You know, you can pay bills on Facebook. You can talk to people, of course. Uh, you, you can shop on there. It, it's got it's it's got us sort of embedded into everything, and it's embedded into every aspect of our lives as well, whether it's through apps or through just you know updates. And it's got this sort of addictive capability that a lot of people are just still hooked into no matter what and um, I just don't see it going away anytime but, soon. But that doesn't stop it being taken to task. I mean why has it never been prosecuted if it's committing crimes? Perhaps. I don't know. I think that in uh, the United States in particular, we have a lot of people who are elected officials who, um, frankly, just don't really understand the sort of existential threat this poses to democracy, or else they do understand it and uh, they're benefiting from it somehow. But they've been very, very slow to act. I mean, what do we have in this country? Um, I think it was a $600,000 fine, roughly mm. half a million pounds. Uh, which is what Facebook makes in 10 minutes yeah. in terms of profit. Uh, yeah. I mean, that is just ridiculous. If you want to bring somebody to task for what you think they're doing... Well, the rules are changing, of course, and GDPR across Europe has changed the rules, on privacy particularly, and now that could be 4% of global turnover. Now, when you start talking about those sorts of figures, then people might start sitting up and listening. And, and they have been taken to task um, over... Well, in, in the sense that they've been sent to the naughty corner. Uh, uh, yes, yes, but, but we've got to remember this is a global organisation, and there is no global... A regulator. We've got to take it step by step, country by country, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and it's up to each of those jurisdictions to make its own rules, to make its own regulations, to hold not just Facebook but all social media companies to account. In a, in a new world, I've got to remember that unfortunately the law is always two steps behind um, as of the rate of progress. We'll get on to specifics. Steve, can I come to you with specifics for just a moment here about how different countries can bring an international organisation to 
account. Perhaps you've got a general view on, on where that's happening. I mean, in the UK, they're talking about making it a publisher, which, which would make it much more legally responsible for the yeah. content it puts out there. Is there any sort of international appreciation that something needs to be done on a global basis? I think there's been an attempt at it. So um, late last year, uh, the UK convened a kind of a pan-national approach to hauling Facebook in front of some legislators and trying to give them a hard time. Um, uh, no one directly uh, associated from Facebook showed up, so there was no Mark Zuckerberg and no Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, but a member of the House of Lords ably stood in. And very interesting that they were able to get a member of the House of Lords. They obviously have Nick Clegg on side as well. So they've, they've, they've colonised the political establishment. Uh, and like Brooke said, uh, politicians uh, have, have benefited from Facebook as well because they're able to uh, reach out to the constituents very, very cost effectively. But I, I think the actual issue, you put it very well, David, they're on the naughty step. Like we, we know Facebook, it's a teenage company. They're, they're teenagers. Mm -hmm. They've been sent to the room. They're doing something bad. The question now is they need to figure out, they've met the big bad world. They created this thing. There were so many unintended consequences. They were privileged. They were moneyed, they were rich, and now all of a sudden they're finding that they this they, this naive outlook on the world is not what is actually well, happening. Listen, and they anybody, need to figure out if they can grow up or not. Anybody can throw in anything they want at this particular point. We haven't heard from you just yet, so I'll, I'll ask you this one. But anybody, please. Um, it is a, a global company. Um, everybody seems to hate it in the headlines except 2.2 .2 billion people. <laughs> so what has it actually done wrong? Well, it's it's not been forthcoming in the data it's collecting, how it's using it, and who it's sharing with, the, the data with. So I think one reason why regulation is so far behind or other policy actions far behind is because if you look at the terms of service that these big tech companies put out, they're very positive. Look at what we're doing for your privacy. We're giving you controls. We're having these open forum sessions. They're written in a very positive light, but they don't actually tell you exactly what pieces of data they're collecting and how they're using them. The closest you can get to that information is in their advertising policies. But, but isn't it just about manipulation? that we should be really concerned. In, uh, election results, mm -hmm. um, harvesting data, targeting particular people in, in a wrong way. Mm -hmm. I give them my data. Yeah. I don't care that I give them my data. It might target me with advertising, but if that's for a pair of golf shoes, I'm pretty happy because that's probably what I'm looking for. Anyway, it's our fault for giving it to them, not their fault, surely. <laughs> well, well. Yeah, yeah, Brooke, Brooke. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I, I, I think we're probably going to say very similar things. You, you, I mean, you, it's you not... go on. You say it. It's very early in the morning. <laughs> Got to keep you awake. It's, it's just not a good faith collection. It's, it's not just advertising. If it was micro-targeted advertising, I've said this time and again, if they're serving me up, uh, you know, whatever Uniqlo is selling, you know, or whatever makeup or books I want to read or something like that, if it's going through my interest to, to sell me things, I mean, it's not okay, but it's something I'm accustomed to personally. You know, I mean, we all are after having been online. But what it's doing, and and this is the really um, disturbing part, is that these these algorithms are manipulating our perception of the world little by little. You know, drip by drip. Mm -hmm. And there are things going on that other people don't see a lot of the time. Um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal was so awful because it was flooding people who it, they'd already targeted as sort of you know. Uh, not not immune, I'll put it that way, not immune to their messaging. Yeah. And they were telling them that they had reason to be scared. They were right to be frightened. They needed to conform, you know, all these things. And it, it was just this sort of dystopian nightmare that went well beyond selling, you know, selling us a, a new pair of jeans that we might like, for example. Is it anyway. the fact that they had no idea that it could get to this point or, or that they are perhaps bad manipulative people in themselves who are running this company? I think we just need to separate out the, the, from Facebook, from the people who are using Facebook for these purposes, because it's not Facebook that's there itself um, attempting to manipulate. It's just providing a platform for yeah, yeah. manipulation. Yeah, big stage. That's, yep. that's, a, that's, a, that's a big distinction mm -hmm. to make. And, and it comes on to the publishing point as well. They're saying, well, we're not publishers. We're just hosting information which other people are, are posting on that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that these, are, these are important distinctions. The question now is, what more should Facebook be doing? doing to, to manage that, that manipulation, to, to inform or to, or to restrict or to somehow regulate. And, and the, the, big, the press at the moment is all about, we've tried it for now for 15 years for Facebook, fewer years obviously for other social media platforms, but self-regulation doesn't work. 
it's not worked. It, it, look, look where we've come to. We now need to step in and do something about it. The question is, who will jump first, and, and what will the what will the reaction be? Stacey, go on. So we, okay. we we went to Brooke when you were in the middle of not a, a flow, but carry on. <laughs> so um, I think I, I would pick up two two points here. One is that what's largely missing from a public debate on this topic is the fact that we're seeing the erosion of information equality. So when you look at the way that advertising or disinformation is being spread online, you're seeing this hyper-targeted to as few as 10 people. Mm. So we're not, it's not a billboard on the side of the street, it's not an advertisement on a TV channel anymore. You're, you're giving specific information to a very small subset of people. And it's not, it's not helping the larger democratic uh, process of information they can ignore like I walked past posters on the London Underground this morning and I thought oh that's a nice picture I'll read that one but other Jack Daniels one was great story but <laughs> other ones you just ignore if you want to I mean we're, but we're reasonably intelligent human beings mm. mm -hmm. why can't we deal with this well we don't know what's true and what's not true what's what's a legitimate content and what's not and if you look at what platforms have supposedly done in reaction to this a lot of the actions they are taking were already in place to address GDPR. So it just Which so is the happened, data general protection. data protection yeah. regulation. So it just so happened this happened at the same time and they were able to rebrand these, these changes on that aspect. But there are other things that the platforms themselves can do. And there are various, not just regulation, but there are various tools that, that governments can employ. And government has a role here. Okay, it's, it, the industry perhaps needs to look after itself. Steve, I, I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, we've talked about some of the problems, uh, the manipulation. Uh, the fact that you cannot ignore it, well, I personally think you probably can, but largely perhaps you, you can't. What does Facebook need to do itself to stay on the, well, to, to get back to the straight and narrow, if, if you're some people, or to stay on the straight and narrow otherwise? What can it do itself? Well, the first thing it needs to do is to stop shooting itself in the foot. Um, if it's guilty of anything, it's guilty of really, really stupid PR. Um, so they keep doing particularly dumb things and they keep getting caught out doing dumb things. Um, so uh, one of the most obvious things is that they, Mark Zuckerberg and Charles Sandberg have been on this kind of mea culpa world tour and they keep popping up in front of people saying, we're really sorry about this. And it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Anytime you see these people, you see them apologizing. And it's not, you know, the old adage, if you're explaining, you're losing. These people are doing worse than explaining. They're saying sorry and explaining. So they're losing twice. Then at the same time, we just have the scandal after scandal after scandal. So Cambridge Analytica is obviously is the main one that everyone has heard of, but they, they keep doing things. They've recently shut down access to uh, ad, uh, ad transparency software. They're trying to join up the back ends of some of their um, kind of frameworks, which lead people to um, make people just suspicious about why they're doing things. So the Data Protection Commissioner here in Ireland has actually um, called out Facebook and said, look, we really need to understand what you're doing. And it's, it's your point, David, it's not actually about the ads you can ignore. By using these services, you are giving them access to an awful lot of your data. You're also giving them access to your friends' data. So they do these things like shadow profiling, that they're actually tracking all the contacts in your phone book, let's say, or this is what they're alleged to be doing. Um, so that when, when, if they actually go on and sign up to Facebook, they have, they have these kind of pre-cached profile of these people. So face, it, it, it needs to mature. It's going back to the earlier point I made. It, it seems that it's a business that needs to grow up. It's 15 years old. And its problem is that it doesn't seem to have a moral compass. They keep doing silly things. They keep doing things that will prioritize revenue over responsibility. And you know what? It's in the Spider-Man position. It's, you know, that line with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> I knew, you, I knew you were going to say out. that because it is attributed to Spider-Man. And I took the trouble of looking it up. And you know who originally said it? We'll go a bit highbrow here. Voltaire. You fact really? check him. I approve. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to bring that up later, but thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's a another part of a long list of things that Facebook is perhaps doing wrong. What does it need to do right to change? How can it get itself, as I say, back on well, one of the things it needs to do is to keep shareholders happy. Well, we know there's one principal shareholder, but there's lots of other people as well. And one way of doing that is keeping the money coming in. And, and how do they do that? Well, it's increasing, increasing numbers, uh, users. And there are, there's a significant uh, country which it's still trying to get into. And China? China. Yep. Um, and, and there's a huge, huge uh, sort of landslide of cash waiting to be taken by Facebook. I don't if hear anybody at the moment saying what Facebook needs to do 
to win back the trust, to keep its shareholders happy and, and to stay on the right side of the regulators. What can it do? Well, if it's going to get into China, it needs to sort its own house out first. And that's the only way it's likely to happen. And China has that power at the moment. It's one of the few countries that does to say, no, until you come over here, this is what you need to get sorted out. Mm -hmm. We're already stuck. Uh, we, Facebook is so uh, sort of, sort of entrenched now into society across every other country just about. It's too late. The horse has bolted. Now everything we're doing is trying to put it back in its cage. Um, China has the opportunity to say from the start, this is what needs to change. And if that can get rolled out across everybody else, then that's what will force it to get its house in. But what is it that China needs to say needs changing? It needs transparency. What there Facebook yeah. needs more than anything is is radical, utter transparency at this point. It needs to yeah. tell us what's going on in those algorithms. It needs to tell us what they've been doing with our data exactly, it, no matter how much it hurts. And uh, I don't know if that's going to, from other stories I've heard about uh, China and um, uh, tech companies that have gone into China, that transparency is probably not going to be compatible <laughs> with what uh, China is going to ask of them. Yeah. But to that, I would yeah, I think add we're looking to China to sort the problem out. We're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I would add a few things that we found in our research on social media platforms response to uh, the 2016 election cycles. And one is updating their policies, their terms of service, their their user policies. They haven't been updated to reflect Nobody the reads current. That. No, but they should be. And this goes back to the transparency point. They should be transparent about what they're doing. So when they uh, they say, Facebook says that it demotes information that's been fact-checked as false mm. news or false information. Now, why are they demoting instead of taking it down? What are the recourses for posters to either bring uh, a case against that to say, well, that was falsely fact-checked and it's actually well, my own let's, content? Let's ask Brooke that because yeah. that's your business. <laughs> well, uh, before I was with Truth or Fiction, I worked for a company that partnered with Facebook, uh, Snopes, and uh, that presented its whole a whole different share of problems. They had no transparency about that either. They told us that if we fact-checked a story, it would, would, would reduce its spread by 80%. And I said, okay, where's the uh, where's the data? Show me the data. Back this up. You can't tell this thing to a bunch of you know investigative journalists and not expect us to ask follow-up questions. But uh, we never saw that. Uh, we never saw any um, indication or any data or any numbers, or at least not as long as I was there, uh, proving that anything happened. In fact, it was quite the opposite. And it, uh, it, to me, it looked as though they had brought us on and other fact checkers simply so that they could say, look, look, this is what we did. Don't, okay. don't say we've never tried anything. Respectability. Transparency. OK. Terms and conditions. I, I don't know anybody who reads those. Well, well, wherever but it's not... it happens to be, I've already said that. <laughs> I've read them. <laughs> but, but the point. But I think... the, the point I wanted yeah. to bring up here was that you talked about keeping the shareholders happy, mm -hmm. and there, there was an article, uh, which was March of last year, which was widely published, which which talked about um, Facebook needs to sort itself out because it's lost a hundred billion dollars in market value over the course of the last two months. Otherwise, it's going to be in real trouble. Well, I looked at the market cap yesterday, market capitalization between August of last year, after it had recovered from that and then took a big drop, it has recovered all of its share price, all of its market capitalization, and it's now higher than it was um, in March of last year at $483 billion. It can't do anything to hurt its financial position, can it? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think part of it is that the network theory works, right? Part of this is the fact that you can now connect with whoever you want that is in your social family network in one place, and it's useful. Um, on the other hand, they are making a big uh, move to try and merge WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook platforms. And we'll have to see what happens with that, because I think Zuckerberg might be taking a false step here and not thinking about why people use those platforms mm. independently. Do the headlines hurt? I mean, we've had a story, you'll be well aware of it, Molly Russell. Mm -hmm. young girl who took her own life mm. uh, in this country. She had been looking at posts on Instagram, which is part of, part of Facebook, and the coroner said this was, the person who looked into her death said this was, you know, part of the reason why mm. she took her own life. Do those headlines hurt? Yes, of course they do. Um, but, it, but it's short. But I'm just looking it's, at this and saying it doesn't. It, it, well, financially perhaps not. Um, but I think people do sit up and take notice. And the, well, the government's taking notice. The government's now, in the UK at least, is stepping in and saying, we need to take more care of our children. We need to instill this duty of care. 
13 year olds officially can use Facebook. We know for a fact that a, a lot of younger people use Facebook. Yeah. But what's the government doing to to? to but I think that's that, virtue signaling from a political party that's desperate to cling on to power. Because <laughs> I mean, they said they were going to do something about this 15 months ago. Yeah, yeah. Officially, nothing, nothing has happened. changed. Well, since there's then. been this morning. On well, guys, the radio. The, yes, yeah, carry on. Been there. Yeah. There's, there's one thing, that, and there's one stakeholder in this whole conversation that we haven't discussed at all, and that's the advertising industry. And if we really want to change things, yeah. we need to actually look at the people who are giving Facebook their money. So we're talking about personal data and all that, but actually, like Facebook's Q4 earnings came out last year, it made $16 billion. That's a lot of money, and that's coming from the advertising industry and from SMEs that are using it to reach out to its customers. How, if we how want do you to get change, the advertisers to do this? Because if they're getting value for money, um, then they're going to be reluctant to leave it, aren't they? Well, a lot of it comes back down to transparency, which we've already talk, talked about. So who's actually auditing Facebook's numbers that it's giving to advertisers? It hasn't got a very good record of auditing itself. And I think some advertising agencies uh, are beginning to be a little bit wary of it. But as we talked about at the start, people, everyone's bought in. Everyone, There's a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy here. Mm. Now, the one advertising agency has gone on the record so far and is saying publicly that it's not advising its clients to spend money on Facebook. Uh, and I think if we're to see any change in how Facebook is doing its business, actually the pressure is going to have to come on advertisers. And ad advertisers are going to be the ones who realize, who take the hit, who join those dots between these terrible stories that we're hearing and how their money is being spent. It happened um, two years ago, I think, on YouTube when there was brand safety issues. Something similar is going to have to happen to actually force Facebook's hand. Okay, and, and Brooke, when, when you say you think worse is to come, do you, do you mean worse for Facebook as an entity or worse on Facebook and its behavior? I think that uh, worse is going to come for Facebook as the public starts to learn more and more about uh, what they've been doing with our data, to be quite honest. I have no insider information other than that. It's just that it seems like we're in the middle of a story, and uh, mm -hmm. before we get to the end, it's going to get uglier. Yeah. But, but talking about advertising, we're talking uh, Instagram, um, Messenger, uh, WhatsApp being sort of brought together. At the moment, there's bits of advertising on Instagram, but it's not, it's not really in the way. WhatsApp, not really any advertising as far as I, I can see. If now that starts to become monetized as well, um, then the, the, the revenue is just going to go sky high if people still put up with it. And I think what people are using Instagram and WhatsApp for at the moment is they don't have this Facebook recognition that it's an owner. Um, they're not related at the moment. Hey, talking of which, way. Facebook recognition or face recognition well, <laughs> is, is, is coming to a, a yep. site near, near you pretty soon. Yep. Is that going to be something to worry about? Uh, yes, I'd say it already is. I mean, Facebook's been doing facial recognition mm. and working with the software for years, I'd say 10 years that I could remember. Mm. And authorities, um, nefarious people could use this to, to their advantage and not to ours. Well, not only that, but I think that we need to think about the data that's being collected and how it might be used outside these social media platforms, such as in New York. Uh, insurers could now use your social media accounts to set your, your insurance levels and your rates. And so we need to think about it. Before, we talked about what the platforms were collecting, how they were using it, how their advertisers are using it. And I think a huge aspect of the problem here is the business models these are built on. But now we're seeing other industries that are going to adopt looking at this data and looking at what you have publicly, and that will infect, affect your life as well. Brooke, Brooke, another thing you said was it should be forced to act for the public good. I don't know how you force somebody to do that, but is that the only way, or can it be persuaded, perhaps? I have lost a so much faith that they can be persuaded in any way. Uh, what I've been doing is taking my complaints into the public square because it seems to me that the only pressure that they've been responding to has been public pressure and, and basically bad press. They seem to very, be very conscious of their image, which I think is a little bit, uh, you know, strange given the fact that they're, they've got a problem with our own images and our own, you know, public sort of uh, facing lives. But uh, I, I really don't think that they can be persuaded. I think that they're very entrenched in their Silicon Valley mindset. And they think that, you know, the little people in the masses uh, don't really know what's good for them. And or, or they just don't care. Forced to do, act in the public good. Um, how, how do you force somebody to do that, Steve? Just through legislation? You could. Well, the one simple example, I mean, Kevin touched on it earlier that Facebook refuses to accept that it's a media company um, 
by in, by my definition of a media company, it attracts eyeballs and an audience and then sells them on to advertisers. That's a media company. So I, I, I think that one thing you could do is make the responsibilities of a media company incumbent upon it. And, and that would be simply something like defamation. And that would be a real game changer. If Facebook was open to uh, people, um, you know, taking defamation cases against us, that would seriously affect its business and do, model. Do, and do, it would need to gear up to respond to that. And do you think that's coming in this country and perhaps in a snowball way? I, I think elsewhere? it is. I think it is. I think the, 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 the governments have no alternative now because I think public pressure will become so and we've not talked about tax um, this is another issue as well of course that that's that, that's that's the that's the stick um, that we can start beating okay. these social media giants with as well and it's not yet been done in any effective way what's gonna happen next oh uh, that's a good question um, I think that we need to have a really good hard look at the business models behind all of this. I and think when you say that, what does that mean yeah. to somebody who doesn't understand? Well, it's an attention economy, right? It's it's they're creating a digital shadow, a digital persona of us, mm. um, and then that is how they generate their money by giving somebody our attention or our our time. Um, and we need to look at how these business models of the, the clickbait economy and the bots that are used to create money for people, um, how, how that's, a, how that's uh, proliferating online. And we need to really look at the baseline, what's underlying it, because right now we're talking about content layer, um, mm. we're talking about whether or not it's a curator. I think in some ways it is, but the difference between Facebook and other media companies is that it curates after something's been published. Listen, thank you very much from California, from Dublin. Uh, and to you two in the studio. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, it's been fascinating. I wish we'd had a bit more time. Uh, but we don't on this occasion, perhaps. I'm well, pretty sure we'll come back to it. Thank you for watching. I'm David Foster. This has been Roundtable. Hope to have you company next time. Bye for now.